I think the impetus for No Child Left Behind, I, th I think there were two. Um, uh, one sort of practical and one more ethical, I guess. The practical idea, I think, is that, again, as a whole country, it is no longer enough for the top 25% of people to be able to be productive, to keep the country moving along. Information technology, all of, all of the, the skills that adults need um, have changed. And um, so from a practical point of view, we need to make sure that all kids are, are meeting at least some minimum standards if we want the country to be, to be okay. Um, the, the more ethical reason, I guess, is when you look at some of the um, inequalities um, that there are children who are better served by the education than others, that there are divides because of social economic status, because of disability status, because of race, because of any number of, of differences, that there are inequities there. And as a country who claims that we value the gifts of all individuals, we should not be allowing there to be systematic differences based on race, gender, disability status, or income. So I think both of, both of those, the pragmatic one, which said everybody needs to learn, and the more ethical one, which says, you know, we have educational outcome inequities that we should be addressing. I think, I think those were, I think those were the, the main levers behind No Child Left Behind. And, and I do think that it helped shine a light on some of those inequities in ways that we hadn't done before. And I think, I think that is not a bad thing. It made districts and states pay attention to children who historically got lost when you do an average. When you, when you have an average, somebody is doing really well, but typically somebody is doing not so well. So when you disaggregate and, and you pay attention to both who's doing really well and who's doing not. I, I think No Child Left Behind was helpful, and I don't, I think that is a legacy that continues, even if you are not being held as firmly responsible for all of your kids. I think the legacy of we need to look all across the spectrum, I think, remains. Now, we run back into how, how is that measured? Well, it's measured on tests. A, are the tests the same across the country? No. Are the cutoffs about what it takes to be called proficient the same across countries, no, uh, across states? No. The way that it changed the nature of schooling, a lot of people saw as very negative because you have a lot of schools, and especially the schools serving the students that are most in need of a good education, the schools that serve students that start far behind. It encouraged schools to spend a lot of time on things like test prep, taking practice tests, learning test-taking strategies, um, things that aren't really helpful for students' development as learners and um, for their you know, for their future and their actual understanding of academic skills. It's just designed to help them do well on the tests. Um, it also really narrowed the curriculum, again, down to just reading and math for students who may have the least exposure to a diversity of environments and experiences. There's a lot of concern that it actually increased inequality, even if it was intended to reduce inequality. We're just putting our focus as a country a little bit more sharply on this issue that are we really providing equal opportunity and equal, like high quality, reliable education for all of our students? And the truth is, we weren't and we're not. Um, and so, uh, as imperfect as it is um, and as it was, NCLB at least got us talking in ways that we weren't talking before. One of the other reasons that I think. Uh it became a major concern is that the way in which people began to think about this notion of accountability in it was by testing people and evaluating them. Um, not necessarily trying to figure out how to help them, but 
determining whether they were good or bad. And if you were bad, then you were done. And not if you were strong or weak and whether your weaknesses could be uh, improved. And so that ended up being a really sort of fundamental breaking point for our No Child Left Behind. I, I think that teachers feel under attack. And I think they have felt that way since No Child Left Behind, where the problems that are that children have that are in a large part out of their control are um, that, first of all, schools are expected to fix them, teachers are expected to fix them, and they're, they feel that they're the that they're under, I, 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 don't, I can't say it any other way other than teachers feel that they're under attack, that they are not um, necessarily respected, um, even though they get, teachers get a lot of positive uh, feedback from parents and often from their principals, but there's a general narrative in this country that says that teachers are the problem here. And if we can fix teachers, we'll fix kids and every child will be successful. And it's um, anybody who's taught for any length of time knows that that simply isn't true and it's impossible. And that there are other issues that kids bring to school that are beyond their control. And so that that it, it's misguided and yet it continues to occur. And even policymakers now, I think, more and more are saying, well, we have to you know, build respect for the profession. We have to do the... So there's a lot of lip service to that, but the policies don't seem to change. So you have the No Child Left Behind where they say, okay, your school had a number of teachers who are not qualified. Then we have, okay, the next big policy a push is for teacher evaluation, and teacher evaluation is going to get rid of all these horrible teachers that are there, um, and that's going to solve the problem. It, you know, it's just not, it's not a broad enough approach to a problem that we have in this country. I think one of the the biggest perils embedded in No Child Left Behind is the fact that it it made sacred and and singularly salient, the, the standardized test score, and as the measure of progress, when, when the very, very best social scientists will tell you that that, that actually isn't the thing that is going to, to, to matter. What really matters is educational attainment, whether kids are persisting and completing school, entering post-secondary school, and completing post-secondary school. Th those are the things that lead to longer lifespan, greater earnings, going to prison less, having children with higher levels of educational attainment. Um, so those are the things that matter, and yet our, our government, our federal government, uh, then amplified and reinforced by state level and local level government, became singularly obsessed with, a, with, with one metric to measure kid performance, teacher quality, schoolhouse quality, and district progress. Mm -hmm.